Swinburne University of Technology. Hello everyone. Last one. Um, number 12. And I've mentioned, I've talked a bit over the last, last 12 weeks. Yeah, sort of impl well, implicitly in the context of what, what this topic is, we're, we're going to look at the theorists today. Um, so by now, hopefully you've got an idea of the different theories I've talked about. I've talked about Marx, Durkheim and Weber throughout. Uh, talked about functionalism and Durkheim and the, sort of, the somewhat sort of conservative nature of, of, of that approach. The Marxist approach, which is determined by, which Marx saw as being determined by the economic system, and and Weber's, I talk about Weber's bureaucracy and his conceptualization of power and being able to challenge the sort of structural notions of society, um, which causes us to conform to society's needs rather than have society conform to our needs and, and Weber's argument that you can push up from the bottom. Um, that was when, when I was talking about feminism. Um, but I'll formalise it today. So I should sit back and be serious. I'll formalise it today. Um, and I'll go, through, I'll go through the early theorists. Um, in the late, this is, <laughs> it's a big one, this uh, Sorry, David. Um, it's a large lecture in terms of the size of the notes. I'm, I'm looking here and it's, it's, it's 18 pages. Um, I should go back and have a look at how that fits on the web page because that would that'd be big, wouldn't it, David? Yeah, that'd be very big. And you probably, you guys are probably going, oh, God, why has he done this to us? Because that's a lot of reading. Um, even for someone who can read. <laughs> Um, but the reason why it's why it's 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 so big is it, well is reason why it's so big is I'm thorough. Um, but more broadly, the reason why sociological theory is so big is that there isn't one there isn't just one sociological theory. There are a series of theories, and sometimes. Theory in sociology is referred to as. I'm going to do it this way because I've been watching these things, and I think this is my bit aside. So let's. Um, <laughs> the reason why um, you sometimes th sorry, this is the reason why uh, sometimes you will come across the term sociological perspectives and I did touch on that in in the first lecture uh, and I should underline that um, perspectives probably can get used loosely and in two ways um, perspectives as in terms of the approach and, and an attitude you have towards it but perspectives um, is like I'm indicating now is, is sometimes a substitute for the notion of theory uh, because in in science, you know, there, there's 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 this idea that you have a theory that explains everything, and not not the theory of everything, which is is um, probably not a proposition much anymore. But because there was the notion of a theory of everything, but um, in science there is a theory that covers a discipline broadly, and all the people who are working in the, the discipline or uh, are adherents to a theory. In sociology there are a number of parallel theories um, that you would imagine could be contradictory but in fact aren't. There, there are different ways of interpreting the world um, and sociology as distinct from the sort of the, the um, what they like to call the hard sciences, um, is able to look at the world in a number of different ways and not have the fact that there are parallel theories uh, be contradictory. And I, I think you've probably worked out, you can see how you can apply different perspectives or different approaches to understanding society um, and, and have them be competing and, and sort of contradictory in terms of the elements of, that they choose to argue um, about uh, in terms of the, the weight of influence. Marx would say that, that, that 
the economic system and capitalism is the dominant influence, whereas Durkheim would say, well, the social formation and, and society is the, the, the dominant influence and the structures that, that sort of are, are built off that. And Weber would, would be somewhere in between and argue that, that, that there is more than just structure that, that determines our, our life chances. So um, while they, they compete in, in the sense of um, the weight of, of force of their explanation, they don't actually contradict each other in terms of uh, one supplanting the other and being the dominant theory and if it's the dominant theory all of the others get thrown away as in sort of the scientific method where you're actually trying to disprove uh, something in order for one explanation to rise up and capture the, sort of the whole of the discipline. Did that make sense? Uh, da oh, David's not sure. Um, Oh, and it's the last week too, so <laughs> I'm going to leave you confused right at the end, isn't that? Just like a man. Uh, <laughs> All right. Um, I think not, anyway. I'm going to respectfully disagree with David and say, um, no, I reckon that was reasonably clear. Um, okay, so... Um, so you you know when you're going through this because it might be it might be useful to walk you through this chapter given given that it's so big and it's sort of fundamental. The other thing I should say about 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 theory and um, and sociology there um, there have been there are mixed views in the discipline that sort of. Uh, my level and higher the people who who write about this stuff and who determine what goes in the textbooks and you know all approaches in all walks of life are subject to to fashion if you like and um, the fashion in recent times particularly in, in the way textbooks are put together is to sort of integrate theory into the discussions of other other things and not have it sort of stand alone um, um, and so in recent years theory has been dropped as sort of daggy or uninteresting um, and but I disagree I think theory is fundamental to to understanding sociology and look when if if you go on beyond undergraduate work and and you sort of get to my level you need some sort of theory to conceptualize how you're going to work how you're going to do your research what aspect or what approach you're going to well, well the combination of sort of aspect of society that you're going to look at and the approach which we'll co loosely call methodology which you don't quite need to know about at the moment just note it um, you need theory in order to to sort of drive as they say these days drive your research so I, I think it's important plus um, well, plus I think it's interesting. Um, uh, some people don't, and obviously the the fashionistas um, in textbook writing ha haven't haven't thought it so. But um, there has been a resurgence. So that Pip Jones book I spoke about um, uh, somewhere. Um, it's um, I think I've mentioned Pip Jones twice. That's it's a book on theory um, that if you're really interested is is worth pursuing. Um, um, it does appear in your text, I think, um, 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 well, it does appear in your text because it's, it's, it's in the, the second, it's in chapter two, I think, um, yeah, um, uh, chapter two, page 38, the classical tradition, traditional perspectives of sociology, so here's the, the reference to, to perspectives, um, and then there are the contemporary perspectives in sociology, multiple perspectives, other voices, and the postmodern, so um, it is there, sometimes the discussion's embedded in, in other things like identity formation, which you'll be well and truly familiar with by now, um, and then uh, I took a lot of it from one of the other uh, textbooks, not the textbook you've had to buy and a textbook that we've, we've made available through the library um, and that is online, the Allen and Unwin book um, by Germoff and Poole. They do, they've, they've done a really quite good uh, chapter on, um, uh, on theory and so the reason why I've included that and referred you to the Pip Jones book 
or Pip Jones and others. Uh, Pip Jones is, is a whole book on theory, so obviously you're not going to be reading that for the sake of, of one week's work. But the chapters in, in the two books that, um, that I've referred you to are reasonably concise and you know, relatively brief, notwithstanding the adding pages I've given you at, uh, at the moment. Anyway, look, the, um, um, <laughs> the early theorists came out of the scientific revolution. Uh, do you remember me talking about this, David? You give me a nod when you rem if you remember any of this, because I don't want to keep repeating myself. Um, but it has 12 lectures or a long time ago. I might have talked about it in the introduction. I think I do. Yeah, yeah, I think I spent, you know, a whole weekend just watching me over and over again. <laughs> I do re remember talking about this stuff. So this is the, the scientific revolution, the Enlightenment, where we moved from, from church... Um, mediated knowledge to, to knowledge um, that was mediated by science, that was, that was sort of clean, cleansed, if you like, of the influence of, of the church or some contextualizing um, moral understanding about how things are that then allows you to make statements about the world. What the Enlightenment did in the, the say around the 17th, mid 17th century was remove this moral overlay, if you like, that, that interpreted Peril, sort of pre-digested um, what your approach was going to be to knowledge, uh, to having a clean, a clean slate, tabula rasa, um, where you could write about about meaning and understanding and facts um, in an unfettered way that simply emerged from from the data if you like from your investigation of the world and and it was the facts that gave us the story and the facts that, that gave us the world um, and how how to understand it and the cosmos because remember when i was talking about it was it was really the investigation of how the the cosmos worked where the um sun and earth were in relation to each other which was at the center and that was the battle and the battle was that you know if god or gods created the earth why would they stick it three planets out anyway after the enlightenment <coughs> or after the scientific revolution and the enlightenment project emerged and and all those early philosophers scientists uh came to the point where where the method of understanding the world was through the scientific method, through investigation and empirical analysis. Um, sociology emerged out of that. The early, the early sociologist, I suppose, the the the, the bloke who started it first was a, a, a someone called Auguste Comte. Comte talked about the a positive social science. You know, one of the was going to be one of the great sciences. Um, and we'd have a science of society where we could seek after social facts, where facts would emerge from society. Um, they weren't interested in what moved the human heart. They were interested in the social interaction, the 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 sort of the 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 effect of social forces on individuals and groups, but not so much the effect that individuals and groups had on society, because that was the scientific method was demanding um, empirical measurement and analysis and and I suppose the, the scientific conundrum for sociology is you can't put us in a room and an experiment on us. You can't experiment on human beings, uh, you know, setting aside some of the evil regimes that have existed in the world um, over modern history anyway who have attempted to do that in, in terms of sort of a social laboratory. It's, it's not really possible. So, of course, that becomes the... Um, that becomes the problem um, for a positivistic and empirical science that's that's focused on society. You can only look at the the forces and the influences and um, how they shape us. You can't look at how we we shape them. So that was that's I think one of the fundamental problems of of that approach. Nonetheless, it's it's. It's a useful approach in that that if you're going to collect, if you're going to understand society, you need some sort of baseline data, some demographic data. Who are they? Um, 
you know, generational information, um, information about sex, information about social location in terms of, terms of socioeconomic status. Those sort of things are important and then you can seek to understand through sort of a qualitative approach. Anyway, so you got these, you got comp kicking, kicking it off and then you got um, the first of the, the three um, founding theorists, if you like, which was Emile Durkheim. Durkheim, you know, talked about the importance of society in, in affirming surrounding social values and, um, and norms and the, that society, um, we were in service of society and the organisation of society was in service of itself to the extent where uh, Durkheim argued that religion um, the formation of religion was obviously a guide to, to sort of sustaining uh, the, the moral and social values of, of the world, the, the society in which you lived. Um, uh, Durkheim sort of went beyond that and, and sort of explained in his analysis that, that in fact when we prayed in church we were not praying to God or a God, we we're actually praying to society, we we're praying to the social formation that gave us um, this methodology of continuing to um, um, maintain and, and um, uh, reassert the, so the, the surrounding social values that had served us so well. He also talked about that in terms of the division of labour, the hierarchy of the division of labour was there to serve society, it was uh, important that we pay doctors uh, larger amount of money than, than somebody else because of the time they took out of society to develop their skills but also what they offered uh, and this sort of trickled down um, in, in sort of relative terms to relative the relative importance of different different jobs this is the division of labor um, and then that, that sort of shuffled around as as um, the needs of society changed, you know, the, techno the, the industrial revolution sh shifted the importance of different roles, different jobs, the uh, digital revolution has, has done the same thing. So that's how Durkheim, Durkheim saw, saw the world from a theoretical point of view. Marx, as, as we've discussed, um, saw the, um, the implement well the development and progressive sort of implementation of capitalism as the defining uh, paradigm um, that determined life chances and and remember to a, to a great extent theorists are looking looking at life chances and the influences on the individual um, and how that molds and shapes us so Marx is um, uh, identification of capitalism um, was unavoidable. I mean, capitalism s really swept through the world uh, through the 19th, the 19th century. And so Marx, Marx argued that, that capital, capitalism caused two, well, one really strict division between the divided two groups, the bourgeoisie, the, the bosses, the, the factory owners, the owners of the means of production, the rich people, um, were well the rich people who owned and controlled the means of production is is probably more more correct because although there were sort of there were there were monarchs and and elites sort of around these groups the the ones with the major influence Marx saw in terms of the development of capitalism and, and capitalist societies were these people who owned the means of production and this is back. Um, back when the industrial revolution had, had, had moved people out of, out of the sort of feudal system into factories. Um, and so you had the, the bourgeoisie, a very small group, and then a mass of people underneath that known as the proletariat. And the proletariat were uh, the workers who only had their labour to sell, um, they didn't have a great deal of bargaining power, they were always oppressed. Um, oh, we did the did we do the shoe thing and the, yeah, great, okay, good. Um, so all that stuff about the, the, the Macintosh shoe, oh, that's right, because, yeah, I had those blue things on. Uh, the Macintosh shoe and the, the um, yeah, what's that, the Frederick Winslow Taylor on the, um, the production line, uh, that was Fordism we were talking about. That came out of the, the sort of the, the Marxist understanding, yeah, the, the, the production line was the, 
the stocks, he would argue, on which the poor were, uh, were punished. Um, so he, he, he saw the, uh, this division between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat as, as hard, uh, enduring and always oppressive um, because of that explanation I gave you uh, about the shoe where the the right of, of people to produce their own goods um, um, their own their own product was 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 stolen from the people and see Marx you know there's lots of myths develop and and offhand attitudes. Marx thought work was the most important activity that people could engage in. That work was the dignifier. Work was what gave identity and and gave meaning to our lives. So Marx, Marx um, wasn't some dopey communist who who wanted a welfare state for everybody. In fact, Marx would have would have argued that the welfare state was detrimental because it meant that that the the revolution couldn't occur that uh, communal ownership couldn't couldn't result because as long as people were sort of pacified through the allocation of resources by the government to protect uh, private interests from the the effects and ravages of of capitalism that was a bad thing the protection through the welfare state so keep it in mind that Marx was was keen on work and the dignity of work and the, the power of work to, to transform. So, um, but the ultimate transformation that Marx saw coming out of the ravages of capitalism um, haven't quite developed. And again, I'll point you to, to, to Greece. I don't know what Greece is gonna be like when you're looking at this, but, but that, that approach that, that you start to see where um, banks and the plutocrats, the, the bourgeoisie, um, um, sort of captured in, in the, the category of, of bankers who, who've caused these problems and then the proletariat, if you like, the public, the citizens of Greece are having to pay for the mistakes of, of this very small group and you get protests and people rising up against that is, is, is what Marx was talking about in terms of, of his, his notion about revolution. And when you put it in that context, you can see that there's, there's a manifest unfairness. On the other side, people will argue, well, if we don't do something about it, then the whole thing will collapse and everybody will pay, pay a price. Um, that may or may not be true, but they, that would be the argument that's, that's had. And then, of course, Weber is the other sort of great theorist, founding theorist we, we, we talk about and, and Weber's idea was, was um, that, that, that the social world could be interpreted, that, that it wasn't simply structural, that it was actually amenable to interpretation and understanding and the individual did have a role and a place in society and, and could rise up through action um, and, and cause uh, cause change. He talked about bureaucracy uh, in in response to the the rise in capitalism, um, and he also he also he, he, Weber had this really interesting um, explanation, which um, has been challenged over over the years and probably substantially discredited in the sense that it it, it wasn't the the totalizing explanation that. Um, that it started out to be, but it was a really inter interesting explanation for how capitalism began. And um, in uh, a book he wrote called The Protestant Ethic and um, the Rise of Capitalism, um, Weber argued that, um, and this was part of, part of his thesis that explained how a small group could, through its actions, rise up. Well, through its actions cause a structural change to the world so that it's not the structures that cause us to conform always, not the structures that always cause us to conform to to their expectations but the actions of a small group like feminists which I mentioned earlier um, a small group could through their actions cause a structural change and a structural shift and and what 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 Weber argued in in the Protestant ethic was that this small group of um, 
Calvinists, a, um, a Protestant religion in Europe, um, around the time that capitalism was starting to emerge, but by no means embedded as the, sort of the dominant economic system, these, this group of men um, out of this religion, um, through their practices, actually caused um, through their practices and their religion and the European nature of the or the the setting of where it where it occurred caused capitalism to spread uh, much faster and wider than than um, you would expect it to and essentially the idea was the 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 Calvinists believed like the Jehovah's Witnesses that uh, God was going to to save souls at the end of time um, that we would die and then God would come down and, and rise us up from the grave. But like the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, God wasn't going to save all of them. Now why, why would you? I'm not joining a religion where it's a gamble, am I? Yeah, no, not me. But they were probably stuck in it for familial reasons and traditional reasons and, you know, why not have a bit of bit of the casino in your religion. Anyway, the Calvinists uh, then, and I suppose this was the cunning, the cunning plan behind it, by through this uncertainty about um, your resurrection um, to the, uh, the better life, the greater life, the, the, the promised life of, of paradise, um, through this uncertainty then you could imagine that people are, are inspired to live the best life they can. And so, of course, um, the Calvinists took it on. Now, if you, think, um, if you think of Charles Dickens and you think of um, those wonderful English dramas that you'll see on the ABC um, that have the, um, the cranky men in the black suits and the top hats who are always unpleasant and mean and sit behind big desks and tell young boys to go off and work in factories or don't give them enough food or aren't particularly pleasant to their wives. You've sort of got the Calvinist type of person that, that Weber was referring to. And what he was actually referring to were, were these, these sort of owners of businesses who through the influence of their religious practice were frugal, possibly mean. Um, and what they did was rather, as, as profits came to them, rather than spend these profits, rather than have the six-way horses and the big carriage and the really flashy wife, you know, and the kids at private schools, they, of course, poured this money back into their businesses. They kept this money turning back in because they didn't want to in terms of, of their religion and their aspirations to, to, to paradise want to be perceived as showy, as flash, as um, liberal with their money. Um, so they, they, wanted, they wanted to sort of determine themselves as appropriate, as frugal, as responsible um, um, in, in light of their aspirations for the greater life. Now, the parallel here between that practice that grew out of religion and capitalist practice was that, that capitalism and particularly early industrial capitalism and even the capitalism we, we had up until about the, the 1980s uh, no I should correct that um, the early industrial capitalism relied on on reinvesting your money, taking all those profits and ploughing it back into the business and you know building bigger factories or buying better equipment so that you could produce more. So turning that back in, not sharing it with the, the shareholders and paying out dividends and like I said um, splurging on, on stuff for the family and tax effective schemes and all that, they just put it back in and increased the, the, so the infrastructure of the business so it was far more efficient and effective and so businesses grew and became more profitable um, in that sort of industrial period. The reason why I hesitated back a, a minute or so ago was in the, the late 19th century, in the Victorian times, we had a laissez-faire, a form of laissez-faire capitalism um, which did allow for much sort of grander spending and, and expression of, of wealth and success. 
Um, and the, the idea of laissez-faire capitalism is, is sort of effectively means no regulation or control. Um, and we've been approaching, well, funnily enough, the rest of the world had been approaching that in particularly in the last 10, 10 years and maybe even in the last five years, we've seen an expression of that through the GFC. Part of the reason why we had a global financial crisis was there wasn't regulation or sufficient regulation in the rest of the world, Europe and America in particular, um, and the reason why we survived was because we did have regulation and control. We had a lot more regulation and control of our, our, our form of capitalism in Australia, despite all of our privatisation and governments getting out of, of the, the economy as much as they could. We still had regulation. This has been a Swinburne production.